Well, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Part of the reason why I call Tina my Stanford mom is her son is named Josh as well. So there's that <laughs> commonality in place. Um, but it was 10 years ago. I actually was running ETL. So this was a seminar that I used to manage as a part of BASIS. Um, I think I still might hold a record. I took this class 14 quarters in a row. So <laughs> if anyone's close to beating that, please let me know as well. Um, but the uh, main goal of this topic, of this chat, is going to be kind of walking through a couple of different chapters in my life, uh, discussing some entrepreneurial stories, trying to share some lessons with all of you, and then hoping to have some good Q&A afterwards as well. So these are the three chapters we're going to be covering. Um, we're going to be starting with kind of where it all begins, kind of uh, upbringing and, and college days as well. Uh, we'll be talking about my uh, prior to startup endeavors, and then kind of wrapping up with a deep dive into Zen Payroll but with a really strong emphasis on the why, not just the how. Um, kind of the motivation to start a business, the values that drive it, and then the mission. What does a mission mean when you talk about startups? So in terms of growing up, um, kind of happy to share with you, I'm one of the few locals. I was actually born in San Francisco. I uh, grew up in Marin County, which if you haven't been there, is great for hiking. And um, my parents are actually both teachers. Uh, my mom's from Bolivia. She came to the US when she was 18. My dad's from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, they're both the first in their families to go to college. And so um, they taught mostly humanities, English, history, social studies. So I didn't have too much personal exposure to technology growing up. But I was always curious about how things worked. And, uh, and frankly, to me, the entrepreneurial journey that my parents were on to move to a whole new country or a city or a state uh, is in and of itself its own story of wanting to make the most of an opportunity. So, uh, the common thread I do see, though, which I'll come back to, is that curiosity and then always being very bothered by uh, inefficiency, which uh, as we get to the Zen payroll conversation, you'll get a tip of the hat on kind of why that's a relevant part of our mission for the business. Um, but uh, kind of bring it all back to Stanford. Again, uh, when I was here, this building didn't even exist. We used to have these seminars in Termin Auditorium, which was a beautiful building just that way, which is now a lovely fountain without any building there anymore at all. Um, but when I came to Stanford, it was 2001. The uh, bubble had just burst. Uh, there was actually, from 2001 to 2003, a 40% decline in enrollment in the CS major. Right? If you think about that, it's kind of inverse to what's happening these days. Um, but I was really excited to study electrical engineering. Um, for me, EE was about really understanding complex systems. And I love the mathematical aspect to it. And I get asked a lot these days, you know, was doubly helpful, is doubly relevant to what I'm doing today. And uh, I think we're going to talk about that in a bit, kind of how academics tie to what you do in a work environment. But um, the answer is absolutely. Now, I'm not using Fourier transforms in my day-to-day -day job, obviously. But um, the ability to understand complex systems and take these really, really complex problems and simplify them to a couple key things that matter, whether it's in hiring or whether it's in um, making a business strategy decision, whether it's in selling a product, developing software, or even in other things like politics or economic development. I really think that, again, that mindset is what's most valuable versus the actual coursework that you're going through. Um, so kind of to, to share a couple of thoughts on college, again, um, all of you are at Stanford or at least a part of the Stanford community. That's incredible. This is an amazing institution. Um, I always tell folks if I could buy stock, in a university, I would buy stock in Stanford because it's incredible to see what the university has done over the last 10, 20, 30 years in terms of really um, driving change in the world. But um, I think that, that question I was asked earlier, again, a lot of students ask me, what, what should I study to go do this? What should I study to go achieve this goal? And I think, uh, to me, the real heart and soul of college is really about discovering who you are, discovering what you care about, understanding the things that interest you. And that requires experimentation. I mean, when I was at Stanford, I worked in uh, three different labs during my time in undergrad. I worked at four different internships each summer, um, different experience, different industry, different area to go deep dive, learn. Um, when I was at Intel my freshman summer, I emailed the entire executive team uh, at Intel down in Santa Clara. And I said, hey, do you have uh, 15, 20 minutes to grab coffee? We'd love to just talk. Um, I'm a freshman intern at Intel. Um, we'd love to get a sense of you know what um, what you do and also why you, why you do what you do. And I met with like half the executive team and I remember at one point um, talking with one of my colleagues who was a PhD graduate and he was wondering why I was meeting with his boss's 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 boss. And I just said, I, I emailed him. 
right? It wasn't that hard. It was simply the act of putting out that, that risk of, hey, fear of rejection, but also um, nothing really bad happens if someone ignores your email. They don't put you on a blacklist. If you email them 100 times in a row, maybe. But um, again, one piece of advice there is send that email. Uh, as a student, you have this almost blank check um, to either email someone in industry, someone in the company you're working with, and just ask for some advice. Uh, and most folks that have come through your uh, shoes um, will want to give back. It's kind of the key to this entire community is the idea of giving back because we've all benefited from it tremendously. Um, but uh, the key thing I also wanted to emphasize there around school is that there, there is no right or wrong answer. I think a lot of times, uh, again, um, students are looking for the right path, the key path to go achieve a specific goal. Up until you go to Stanford, it's pretty clear. Get good grades, go to a good school. Afterwards, there is no clear path. It's really what you want to make of it. So make sure you explore. Um, but to shift into chapter two, um, this was right when I was graduating. I was a Mayfield Fellow, as Tina mentioned. My internship was at a company named Zazzle. Um, I was either going to do a PhD in neural prosthetics, which is a really interesting topic if you guys have any questions about it. Um, or I was going to go join a software startup. And what I concluded was um, what I really wanted to do was be involved in solving a problem end to end, where I could be understanding the customer need, developing the solution, iterating, developing, improving it, and then you know, obviously bringing it to that customer and continuing that cycle. And so that's why I joined Zazzle full time. I was a product manager, which is an amazing job for someone right out of school. It gives you a chance to really understand prioritization, but also um, Again, you're kind of responsible for a roadmap, responsible for something being done, but you're not actually a manager of anyone. So the ability to influence and inspire without being able to say, do this because I told you so, um, is actually a really, really useful skill to have. But um, what I loved about the mission at Zazzle, if you're not familiar, is um, it was a way for people all over the world to go uh, build products, um, digital products, and then whenever someone else bought it, or bought it, um, those products would be manufactured and shipped out. So for me as a PM, it was a chance to go enable people all over the world to make a living doing things they loved, right? Designing awesome products, expressing their creativity. Um, and this is actually a photo of Alejandro. He's an uh, artist in Uruguay who literally makes um, tens of thousands of dollars a year by just uploading his paintings through the website at an internet cafe near his house. So um, I guess the main advice I have there on kind of choosing where to go when you graduate is really think about um, who you want to become like. I think, again, Stanford students, it's easy to kind of want to build frameworks and spreadsheets and come up with you know, the 20 different optimizations on you know, growth rate and funding amounts and all these different ways to determine which company you should join. Um, one way to simplify it is just to think about um, who would you like to become like? Because you become like the people you spend time with, whether you want to or not. And so you know, choose wisely would be the main piece of advice there. Um, another topic related to uh, school that I, I really am passionate about, um, this is just one framework, there's many frameworks, but in my opinion there really is two main types of learning. There is uh, academic learning and then there is kind of tactical learning. And academic learning is a chance to learn purely for the sake of curiosity, right? It's why many of you are here in school today, it's a chance to go discover, try different things, you're interested in a subject, figure it out. And, uh, and it's amazing, it's a huge part of my foundation. Um, but everyone has to make a choice at some point on how much of their life should be spent doing academic learning versus tactical learning. And tactical learning happens just as much in a startup. It's learning whatever you need to learn to overcome whatever obstacles in front of you. And then you move forward again to the next obstacle. So it's a different type of learning. Um, for me, that was a big part of why I left uh, the PhD program was my desire to have that kind of 90-10 split on academic versus tactical learning shift to kind of a 10-90 split. And uh, today, even now, it's really awesome to spend some time on campus, speak with different professors. You know, I don't think you ever want to have that go to zero, but the chance to still have that um, curiosity be explored in whatever discipline you're focused on uh, is really important. Otherwise, you can get caught up in the tactical piece every day, and then that can help you get burned out. Um, so Zazzle grew very quickly. Uh, I was there from about 20 employees to about 150. Um, and then in 2008, as Tina mentioned, I um, started a company with a colleague of mine, um, actually a friend who I'd gone to Stanford with, but he had been at Google for four years. And the way I would summarize this startup experience, it was a two-year chapter in my life, um, was that it was very reactive, you know, to kind of be very open and transparent with you. Uh, again, there's many reasons to start a company, many ways to build a business. Um, this was right when Facebook platform launched in 2008, and I had 
just been finishing up my master's. I was working full time and doing my school part time. And um, uh, I took the class at Stanford called the Facebook class, if you guys have heard about it. It kind of became a pretty infamous class um, because of the companies that came out of it. But um, what happened with this business was we were making you know, $1,000, $2,000 a day really in our first month of operating. And it was these platform of applications where other businesses could go build apps on Facebook uh, if you didn't have any technical skill set. So there was some elements of, I think, mission involved in terms of enabling these business owners. But it was also just a very reactive business where we were like, hey, this is working. Let's keep doing it. And um, what happened was over the ensuing year, year and a half, um, we kept doing well financially, but um, it really felt like something was missing. It didn't feel like uh, we knew where we were going over the next two, five, ten years. And as we were hiring teammates, um, that bothered me. right? If, if I didn't feel like this is something I could spend 10, 20 years working on um, and speak about thousands and thousands of times with the same conviction and passion, then it didn't feel right. And so that was why, even though we had uh, offers for funding at that point, uh, we ended up going down the acquisition route. It was because it didn't, and no judgment on the space of social media. If you guys are passionate about it, you have to find what's authentic to you. But it just was too fluffy for us, and that was why we went through the acquisition. Um, so you know, that kind of leads to a, a really important, I think, message, which is uh, the power of introspection. I mean, I went through a period afterwards for a few months of really trying to understand uh, what I enjoyed doing in the previous several years, what I wanted to do different, what had worked, what hadn't worked. And, um, and this is a message in general, not just related to you know, in between startup chapters. I mean, I think one of the beauties of school is you have these uh, quarter systems, right? Where basically every, in between every quarter, you have to decide um, what classes did I like and what classes did I not like and which classes do I want to do different next quarter. And if you can imagine when you start working, um, those quarters go away. You, know, you can have 10 years of work pass by without ever taking a step back to determine do I like what I'm doing? And a lot of folks that don't take that time end up being unhappy, even though they're quote unquote successful professionally, because they haven't taken the time to really think about, is this what they want to spend their time doing? So my biggest advice here is, even when you graduate, set up your own quarter semester system. It could be weekly, monthly, uh, quarterly, or yearly, whatever cycle you're on. This is a photo of Palo Alto Foothills Park. Um, I used to, when I lived down here, go down there uh, every Sunday. It's just over um, Page Mill. Um, and it's a, a gorgeous park, but for me, nature is a place to find solace. Whatever it is that gives you that place to think more deeply about what's working, what's not working, make sure you set aside that time. Otherwise, um, life will just pass you by. So for me, that introspection led to a pretty extensive kind of uh, thought process around what had been missing in my prior startup, right? Why had I, even though it was succeeding, quote unquote, financially, um, why was I still kind of feeling like there was something missing? And the answer for me was um, it didn't feel like a mission. You know, when I had started the nonprofit in college um, and we were building this movement around helping ch students in the US and China um, go do social projects together, get to know each other better, try to help other people. You know, I would be working till four or five in the morning. I'd be recruiting students. We built up all these different chapters and it didn't feel like work. It just felt like something that I really believed in and I really cared about and I was happy to talk to pretty much to anyone I met. And so um, I kind of went through this introspective process to figure out what are the types of problems I really cared about. And this was the outcome of that. Um, it was really understanding that you know, these are the types of missions that I could get behind and we're gonna influence how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. And so to go through the three, and again, these are just personal to me, um, they can be very different for you. Um, it was number one, businesses that help someone make a living doing something they love. Um, that was kind of why I had joined Zazzle in the first place. It was incredible to empower someone to follow their passions um, and be able to then live in a, in a capitalistic world with the capital they need to survive. Um, two is businesses that help someone do something they've always wanted to do, more from an empowerment standpoint. It's one of the you know, most amazing aspects of technology is the ability to kind of take things that previously used to require tons of equipment or tons of money or tons of people, and now you know, literally one person can do it. I mean, what's happening with drones right now for photography and videography is incredible. I have a lot of friends that are really enjoying some of those technologies. And then the third was kind of back to my earlier point on being bothered by um, inefficiency. You know, any kind of product solution that just brings massive time savings, massive cost savings to the world, was something that I could really get behind. Um, so that kind of leads to the third chapter, which is um, the creation of Zen Payroll. So Zen Payroll, we started the company about three years ago. And um, 
I have two co-founders. We're actually all electrical engineering from Stanford, so I kind of joke that uh, EE has a lot to do with payroll software. Um, actually, our head of design is also EE. Um, our first engineer was EE. Um, my wife is EE, actually. But um, nothing against people that are not EE. Um, what really brought us together, before we kind of dive into like how we built the business, what brought us together, again, is, is not um, some mapping of strategic skill sets or some spreadsheet optimized on complementary value add. It was values, right? To me, uh, all of us had had prior startups. We were all at a very similar stage in life of wanting to go solve a problem that we could imagine spending the rest of our life working on. And that was what glued us together. It wasn't, again, some logical mapping of skill. It was, frankly, the three of us connecting around kind of what we cared about in life and what we believed in. And so um, that's one advice I have for folks that are interested in starting companies. When you're starting, uh, especially with who you choose to partner with and found a company with, what matters way, way more than, than skill or expertise is um, understanding that person's motivations, understanding what they stand for, uh, and making sure that's aligned with your motivations. Otherwise, um, it's going to be hard to go build that business together for the long term. And I think the, uh, the way I would summarize that is, again, there's, there's many ways to build a company. Um, we were solving a problem by creating a business. Uh, we were not interested in creating a business to go solve a problem. And it's, again, a very different mindset to kind of be focused on the problem as your starting point versus all the logistics of building a company. So in terms of uh, how do we choose this idea, um, we really had two catalysts. Uh, one was we had all run prior startups, so we had all kind of been through that journey. Um, we had sold prior companies too, but we had all run payroll. So that was one personal frustration. If any of you have run payroll using historical legacy systems, it's a pretty time-consuming process. And then two, um, almost a coincidence until you realize how many people have uh, small businesses in their family. Um, each of us had family that had run payroll too. So Tomer, who runs our product team, his uh, father owns a small clothing store in Haifa, Israel. And he had been um, helping his dad in the back office since he was a kid. Uh, Edward, who runs our engineering team, uh, his mother runs payroll for a doctor's office in LA. And then my mother-in-law actually runs payroll for companies down in uh, Silicon Valley. So those are kind of the two catalysts. And again, in terms of the business types that we were attracted to, um, I kind of bucket those into two worlds. There's businesses that are out there to go invent whole new use cases for the future, you know, things that uh, have never existed before. And Facebook is a great example. And the biggest puzzle there is, you know, will a billion people want this? Will two billion people want to use this? Um, but there's also a whole other category of businesses that are about really just fixing existing problems, uh, improving existing industries, um, using changes in technology, shifts in society to go um, kind of redo what has been done in the past. And these are companies like Nest, right, redoing how thermostats function, companies like Square, redoing how point of sale systems function. You know, the three of us all gravitated towards this category, kind of the ability to, from day one with one customer, know that we were actually solving a real problem really resonated with us. And again, there's many entrepreneurs that have been successful in both buckets, but try to figure out, as you think about your journey, which one you gravitate towards, because um, it's hard to move to the other unless it's what you really believe in. So uh, the way we got started, um, as any, uh, any startup should, is talking to customers. This is uh, Christina Stambell. She actually uh, started a company called Farm Girl Flowers in San Francisco. It's actually a really cool story, which um, you guys should all use her product. It's a great flower service. But um, we talked to a lot of these customers, and we were pretty shocked to learn. Again, it wasn't just our pain point. If you're building a business just for yourself, you have to figure out how big is the market, how many people actually share this pain. Uh, we were shocked by two statistics. Um, more, number one, we were shocked by the fact that uh, of the 6 million businesses in the U.S. today, um, about a third of them every year get fined for incorrectly doing their payroll taxes. Um, and that's every year. About a third of companies make mistakes and get penalized. And then the second stat we were shocked by is that about 40% of those 6 million businesses uh, that need payroll uh, do payroll today by hand. So they do it on spreadsheets. They do it manually. Uh, Eddie's mother was one example, uh, having done it by hand for 25 years. And so that was shocking to us. That didn't make any sense. Um, you know, it, uh, if you look at payroll, it's a set of complex rules, 15,000 different tax codes. You know, these are entrepreneurs. These are small business owners that have been wearing 20 different hats, trying to figure it all out on their own. And they haven't really had the benefit of, of software to help them because they weren't really a cost-effective market to go serve. 
And that's changed, right? Now these folks are on the internet, they have mobile devices, they use Google to search for new products to use. They're finally an audience that you can bring a service to. And it was very clear to us that payroll should not be done by hand. Um, and so we wanted to build a product. I use Gmail as the analogy. You know, you don't have to know how uh, SMTP or IMAP or POP3 works to send a message to someone. You shouldn't have to know all the different tax codes and compliance requirements to go pay someone, right? To go build a business, um, which is really a lot of the foundation of the American economy. And so those were two stats that shocked us. Um, and then I think the, the second thing I'll mention is, um, you know, we had never done payroll before. And I think this is a lesson too for a lot of folks that sometimes get intimidated by, oh, I've never worked in that industry before. How can I solve it? How could I do something better? It's actually a huge strength to not have been in an industry before, as long as you know what you don't know too, right? So obviously, when it came to payroll compliance, we hired some folks with 20 years of experience in taxes and compliance because that has to be done correctly. But when we looked at payroll, um, you know, many of you probably today, when you hear the word payroll, think of it as this chore or this hassle. Um, uh, or don't even know what it really is until you get paid. Um, we thought of it very differently. And for us, we thought of it as having these two building blocks. Uh, on the one side, it's an employee getting paid. And um, hopefully all of you are in this boat too, but people love to get paid. I mean, every two weeks, we send an email to tens of thousands of people that says, you got paid today. And that comes from Zen Payroll. You can guess what the open rate is of that email, what the click-through rate of that email is. Um, so that seems pretty magical, right? We're kind of enabling this really meaningful part of what it means to work. And on the other side, it's employers you know, rewarding their employees for their hard work. It's helping them feel appreciated for what they've done. And you know, that was a shocking realization. Again, for us, that seemed like common sense. But that's not how this industry has worked in the past. In the past, payroll has been an ID number where you get you know, set a specific uh, employee number ID. And then you kind of have a transaction. You don't even know when you get paid. It's in your bank account. And for us, it seemed very clear that payroll is actually, in reality, more about people than payments. Right? It's about this relationship between these two stakeholders. So that was um, something that really influenced how we think about the business. And you know, one of our investors is Drew from Dropbox. They have a very similar story, where their first 100 employees, no one had a background in storage. Because Dropbox was not building storage systems. What they were building was a new way to share and access your information. So. Um, don't be intimidated by your lack of knowledge. Again, in many ways, it can be a huge asset to you as well. Um, just to quickly highlight kind of what our mission is, and then we'll come back to kind of the, the why and the how. Um, this is how we think about our identity today. It's to go take all of that unnecessary pain, all of that um, difficulty that a small business owner has to go through, and remove it, right? I mean, these are folks that have been uh, on their own for a long time. No one's told them to go start a business. If any of you go start your own businesses too, it's really a labor of love. And it's not, uh, it's not just done to go create you know, huge businesses at IPO. Oftentimes, it's business owners that are paying for their family, um, covering their cost of living. Um, and we want to remove that pain. Uh, a third of companies should not be getting fined every year for incorrectly doing their payroll taxes. Uh, the second is to really celebrate this human aspect of what it means to work. Uh, in Silicon Valley, we talk a lot about um, wanting your work to matter, wanting to have impact with what you do. Um, we really believe that same message applies to uh, flower shops, bakeries, cafes, churches spread across the country. And uh, one of our goals is to bring that ability to those businesses. And then the third one is all about the employee. Um, this is, uh, again, when you think about different trends in society, people now work in many companies throughout their life. And so the ability to help people save better, plan for retirement better is a key part of our mission as well. Um, but to kind of dive now into uh, the journey as well, this is a, a fun photo. We were in a Y Combinator during the winter 2012 batch, uh, living in a house not too far from here. Um, and uh, whenever you start a company, it's a pretty intense time. You're spending a lot of hours together. My commute was walking upstairs, which was pretty phenomenal. Today, it's about a half block walk, which isn't too bad either. Um, but one funny anecdote to share, um, during that time, Eddie actually uh, was living in the city, two hours of commuting. Every day doesn't make too much sense. So we rented him our closet for $350 a month. Um, and to be clear, too, it, it had a queen size bed in it. It had a skylight. Probably would rent for like $3,000 a month in San Francisco these days, given rent prices. But um, again, it kind of reinforces that message that it's, it's about shared values and really being excited to spend that amount of time together, because it is a very intense experience to build a company. Um, in the same vein, um, one thing I also love to talk about is, is kind of the approach to fundraising. 
Um, for us, uh, fundraising has never been about capital. Um, it's about people. And if you think about it from that perspective, you can almost apply the same lens you do to uh, fundraising as you do to hiring. Right? So for us, when we hire someone, it's about their values, their motivation, and their skill set. Uh, when we fundraise, it's the same idea. This person is now going to become a part of your community. They're going to be an ambassador for your business. Um, they're going to represent you in an external context. And so for us, we think about it uh, as very analogous. And these are, again, some amazing folks that we're proud to have involved. Um, these folks didn't invest because of the desire to simply you know, make a 10x, 50x, 100x return on their investment. Um, they invested because they really cared about the mission. And this is one thing that makes Silicon Valley really special. All of you are a part of this community. It's uh, not a zero-sum game. You know, that's what makes, in my opinion, Silicon Valley really tick, this idea that there is a camaraderie amongst entrepreneurs where you want to help each other out. And if you care about the mission, you share values with the founder, then by all means, you want to support that individual. Um, so you know, business is doing well. We can gloss over this. Uh, we're proud to be serving many, many companies. We have a lot more work to do. I mean, any success that we've had thus far is due to the team we've built. And ultimately, uh, we're never done. I mean, that's, I think, one of the key lessons in startups. Something I tell my team pretty often is that um, we can always get better, right? I think if, you, if you're part of a growing company, we're about 75 employees today. We'll be a couple hundred by the end of the year. Um, you know, there's an easy pattern to kind of get into where you uh, want to solve a problem, fix it, be done with it, and then you know, never come back to it. And the magic of a startup, and also sometimes the frustration, is that you can solve a problem, have a great conversation, fix that issue, and then three days later, five people join the company, and they weren't there for that. So now they have to go figure out what's going on again from day one. And so that ability to repeat and actually look forward to repeating these discussions and know that every time you can get better has been a key part of our growth thus far. Um, so I kind of mentioned values a few times. Um, this is a topic I really love talking about. Um, and I, I was at a panel recently where someone said you talk more about values than any founder they've met. And I'm proud to be called a values founder if that's what I'm known as. Um, you're never going to see our values on our wall. These are just a couple of them. Um, you're never going to see them printed out on placards. Uh, values are you know, who you are. Right? You don't have personal values, professional values. It's really what you stand for. And again, there's no black and white answer here. There's no right or wrong value. But if you're building a team or building an organization, you want to understand your identity. And then it mostly impacts hiring. It impacts the way that you decide to add people to your team. Um, otherwise, you can become uh, very, very split in terms of what your mission is. So just to walk through these three, and, and by all means, if these resonate with you, feel free to use them, make them a part of whatever mission you're on. Um, but one of our core values is uh, ownership mentality. And for us, this really means um, two things. Again, in Silicon Valley, every startup gives equity to their employees. But um, I think a lot of folks overlook the second impact of, of giving equity, because it, it definitely aligns for economic outcomes. That's fair. But the other impact is that everyone in a startup is an owner of the business. Literally, right? And no one should be treated like an employee. So as a management team, you have to think about how to go empower folks as owners, where no one's there just to accomplish a single task. And this one really mattered a lot to me when I was at Intel. And I had a great time at Intel. But I remember one anecdote where um, during that summer, I wanted to work on a project. No one was working on it. It needed to get done. And I volunteered to do it. And someone told me, don't, don't do it. It's not your job to do it. And um, that thought really stuck with me, right? It, you know, how does that? makes sense. How does that work? How does a company develop that mindset? Um, and this, to us, is, is basically the antithesis of that. right? It's how do you empower people to not just come in and do one job or do one specific task, um, but to be there to go come and accomplish this common mission and then do whatever they can to make that a reality. Um, the second one is how I started. Uh, again, I think um, you know, one opinion I have on society is I think we're all moving towards a much, much faster cadence in terms of instant gratification from whatever we do, whether it's in media or politics or stocks. Um, but building things that are really great, that have a big impact on the world, take time. And um, if you do have that choice or that goal to go build something for the long term, then it's really important to know um, what that means day to day. In our case, it means how we hire, it means how we fundraise, uh, a bunch of different lessons. So again, there's nothing wrong with wanting to build a company for two years and then planning to sell it. But if your goal is to go build it for the long term, then make that a core part of your DNA. Um, otherwise, you can have a misalignment within your team. And then the last one is really connected to the first, uh, transparency. Uh, again, there's um, many different ways to run meetings in a business. You know, in our case, every two weeks, we have all hands where literally we walk through financials, 
um, performance metrics, um, lessons learned. Um, I share things that I've done wrong if I've made a mistake, and I own that in terms of uh, ways that we can improve as an organization. And it, again, it sets a great example to others in terms of um, you know, trusting your team. Right? If you're going to be an owner in a business, you should be given the information to think like an owner. Otherwise, a lot of companies get caught up in this privacy, secrecy type thing where um, it almost turns into a distrust thing where you don't trust someone with the information that they want um, because you're afraid what they might do with it. I'd rather just hire people that we trust from day one and then empower them to be owners in the business. Um, another topic I get asked a lot about is uh, you know, how does the role of CEO evolve or change? What does it mean to be a CEO? And this was a question I asked myself a lot when I was uh, at Intel as well, where the CEO of Intel literally had, you know, I think at that point there were 70,000 employees. And I wondered, how does a, how does a person leading a 70,000 person company know how to spend his or her time? Um, right? You could literally have like an hour free and, and call a head of state or call a journalist or hire someone or do all these different tasks. How does that not just overload your synapses? Um, and the answer is, you know, in some ways, it's, it's all about delegation, right? It's about firing yourself from as many jobs as you can. That's a path I've been on since early days of the company. Um, but what that leaves is kind of where I am focused. So these are the three things that I've concluded are really my long-term responsibilities as a leader in a growing company. Um, the first is really making sure we've set good direction and strategy for the business, right? Everyone's looking to me to help facilitate, but then ultimately drive what matters, right? Where are we focused? Why are we making this bet? Uh, why is this the direction that's best for the company? And that's something that ultimately I have to be responsible for. Um, the second is, how do we organize? How do we communicate? How many meetings do we have? When do we have meetings? Why should we have meetings? Um, and then also, how do we hire, right? Which role should we create? Which team should we create? Um, and what responsibilities do we give to those individuals? Uh, and then the third one is, again, really personal. It's it's the chance to lead by example. It's basically my actions being what everyone reads into. And most of that manifests in the context of hiring, where I spend 50% you know, of my time interviewing people. All right? That kind of might seem crazy to hear that, but um, that's the way it's been for two years now. And that's probably the way it'll be for the next five or 10 years. And so um, interviewing is a really important skill. If you guys have any questions, you can come talk to me after. But uh, the ability to interview, I think, is something that everyone should build as a skill set. When I was at Zazzle as a First job out of school, I was a PM, but I also volunteered to run all of our Stanford College recruiting. Um, it's just like a muscle you have to iterate and get better at it through practice. And interviewing, again, you can always get better. So, you know, kind of to get closer to wrapping, I um, just wanted to highlight I think it's an incredible time to be in technology and startups. Um, I list out some businesses here, but really the main message is there's a lot of problems out there. Uh, and a business exists to solve a problem. So as long as there are problems, there are opportunities for new businesses to be created. And so you know, my um, encouragement to you is to find a problem that really matters to you, something you care about, something that you really believe should be solved and that you know, really, again, affects you that it's still persisting in that way. The same way that for us, realizing that it was a third of companies getting fined and you know, all these businesses being run as if it was a transactional system versus a business being about people and community. Um, but that's what spoke to us. If you find something that speaks to you, uh, there's a lot of problems out there waiting to be solved. And you know, that's the magic of entrepreneurship, is this idea of wanting to take the impossible and make it real. And against all odds, with a team that shares a value system and is on this mission, um, kind of say we can do it. Say we can do something that everyone says we can't do. And so uh, again, Stanford is a big part of that. Many of you are already a part of that community. But it's really inspiring to me to see all these examples around us. And again, all the cool ideas and projects that will come in the future. So to kind of uh, wrap on these three lessons, um, kind of in, in a summary format, um, number one, um, introspection. These are kind of the three I would love to make sure you remember. Um, make sure you set aside that time. Um, maybe in school, it doesn't seem like you need it because of the quarters or semesters. But definitely after school, create some structure that makes you take a step back, detach from the day to day. Um, in our company, we care so much about this that on everyone's one year anniversary, we give them a free plane ticket anywhere in the world. And they have to use it by their second year. So we basically force them to leave. Um, and that's a way for us to get them to go, again, leave, detach, take a step back, and really think about what they're doing, what they care about. And they come back a healthier person. They come back a healthier teammate. Now, you can do that on a smaller scale. For me, Sunday afternoons, and when I go to the gym are really my places of introspection, where I try to detach from email, detach from um, Slack, or all the different 
projects I'm working on and just kind of, again, think more broadly about what's working, what's not working, how am I spending my time? Um, number two is, uh, again, when you decide to join your first company out of school, um, one way to think about it is not this huge complex framework on all these different optimizations, but rather um, decide who you want to become like. Right? When you spend time with them, when you're interviewing, interviewing isn't just about them learning about you. It's reciprocal. You're learning about them. Right? And that's your privilege. That's your right to basically ask them questions, understand what they stand for. You know, it's not just about asking for the job, what am I going to do, who's my boss, but ask things like, you know, why do you do this? And why does this matter to you? And what is your motivation? And I kind of sometimes channel my inner two-year-old. I just ask why over and over again, right? Just why. And someone answers, and I say why. And you kind of really get back to the core of what drives someone. And if you're going to join a company, you really want to understand what drives the person you're joining um, because you're going to become more like them whether you want to or not. And then the third one, um, which probably comes across in how I talk about what I'm doing, um, if you're starting a business, imagine the 10,000th time you're going to be talking about it. And think about if you'll be just as excited and just as passionate as the first time. Because by the 10,000th time, you definitely can't fake it. Um, and that was what drove me in my last business to want to sell it. And with this business, this is probably my 500,000th time describing our mission, ZP, um, every time is a privilege. Every time is a chance to share with someone something I believe in and care about. And ask yourself, if you're mission-driven, um, if that will exist. Because um, you can't, again, artificially create that. It has to be there or, or not. So uh, in closing, I want to actually read this quote um, to everyone. It's a little bit long, but I think it's very relevant. Um, this is a quote from Steve Jobs. And I think it's a great way to uh, kind of drive home this message. Um, Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can build your own things that other people can use. That's maybe the most important thing. It's to shake off this erroneous notion that life is there and you're just going to live in it um, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. And I think, again, uh, Steve Jobs puts everything perfectly, and so... Rather than me trying to paraphrase, I thought it'd be better to read it to you. But that is the magic of entrepreneurship, right? That's the privilege we have in being a part of this community is the chance to go kind of have these bold ideas and against all odds say, hey, we're going to go make that a reality. And so um, if you guys have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. If you're up in San Francisco, please come visit. Um, if I can be helpful to you, please let me know. Q &A. I'll throw the first question out. Yeah. So you talk about your tricks of interviewing. Mm. For those of us who do it a lot, uh, it would be super great to get some of your secret insights. Secret insights. So uh, the question is about interviewing. Um, so most of my interviews, I'm now usually the last person in the interview process um, because there's a lot of other folks involved before that. So my interviews are primarily focused not on skill set, but on values and motivation. So the way I usually love to have that discussion, I mean, the main tip is that why which is whenever someone answers, it's easy to see them get into a pattern of listing out accomplishments or skill sets. Um, ask why. Ask if they made a life change, um, why they made that change. And so I always usually phrase the question, um, to me, life is about chapters. I love reading, so I call them chapters. My colleague loves baseball. He calls them innings. But I ask, you know, for these different chapters you've been through, why did you make that transition? What were you looking for? What was different? What was working? What wasn't working? And then for this next chapter you're envisioning, um, what do you want? What are you looking for? Uh, because the whole goal of the interview is not to have me grill them or them to grill me. It's to understand if there's an alignment, right? The whole point is just to get to know each other better, understand your values, motivation, and skill set, and then figure out, hey, there is a match here in terms of what we need and what we want and what you are interested in doing and providing. And so that's one of the ways that I get to that answer. Any more questions? Right here. Um, obviously, like, the payroll is different in each state. How do you approach like a new state with a new set of regulations where you know maybe it just doesn't work in one state? How do yeah. You approach like the the dead cases, you know. The yeah, payroll is very complex. Um, it, I joke about it. You know, we we started two years ago. We launched two years ago. We've been live for three years. We went kind of public access two years ago. Um, payroll is never in beta, never in pilot. So. We never had a period of trial. It has to work right from day one. But we started only in California. And today we're in 40 states. We'll be in all 50 in the next three months. Um, 
every state is actually more like a country. So I kind of joke that we've launched 40 countries now because of the way that US was created. Um, states set their own policies around tax, around compliance, around reports. So that's much of our, I would say, secret sauce is the ability to take all of that complexity, all of that paperwork. You know, a business is not made better by writing their name in a better font, right? They just have to write their name and you know, we have to do that for them automatically um, so they can focus more on the people side of their business. Uh, but it is a complex technical task. Yeah. Do you have any for the sake of your mission, for say, staying true to your mission, like growth or anything like that? Yeah, so I think, absolutely. Uh, the question was about any sacrifices or trade-offs we've had to make in the context of our mission. Um, there's trade-offs all the time. And it basically, to me, it ties to prioritization. I mean, the biggest puzzle in a business, and I get that asked that question a lot too, is not um, what are all the cool things we could do. Um, it's what should we do now, right? Because uh, if you're in a business that doesn't have a lot to do, you're probably not in a very interesting business. So I just assume we have a million things to do at all times forever. And so then the puzzle is, you know, what we do next, what we do after that. Um, so for us, the value system on long-term thinking is why we launched only in California. Uh, it's also why we didn't rush launching other states where we would be, we could have been nationwide with about a partial solution where you have to do your compliance yourself, but we do the payments for you. And we knew that we wanted to be comprehensive and develop a brand that said you can trust us with every detail. So we basically took two years that could have taken three months to be nationwide um, because we want to build a business for the long term. So every value, I think, again, it drives the behavior where you want to see if you're authentic to it. And it's not black and white. That's probably one of the trickiest parts of, of strategy is that you know, if there's black and white decisions, that's almost ethical, right? And that's pretty clear. It's like the right way to treat someone, the right way to hire, the right way to empower someone. And the, uh, the tricky part of strategy is you have these two extremes, and then you have where you want to be. And the way I think about it is you want to set a goal. We want to be here in terms of our target, and then you want to hold yourself accountable to it. Um, so the key is the accountability piece, right? If you set a goal of, hey, we're going to be more focused on growth this quarter versus more focused on architecture, then make sure that you know where you want to be in that process, and then hold yourself accountable to it. about children, people you admire. So can you name a few people who really influence the way you think about starting companies uh, from this ecosystem? Yeah, so the question was um, talking about role models and kind of who I admire, who I look up to. Um, we feel privileged. A lot of the folks I look up to are now investors in ZP. Um, so uh, Randy Komazar, who actually I met through Stanford in a class he taught before he joined Kleiner Perkins, uh, is one of our investors. He's been a personal mentor for 10 years. If you haven't read one of his books, um, The Monk and the Riddle, it's a great book on living a purpose-driven life. Um, so he's someone that I'm proud to have involved in the community. Um, and then from an operator standpoint, um, Jeremy Stoppelman is also someone that has always been inspiring to me. Um, again, uh, really interesting story in terms of how they started Yelp, which I can get to later if you want. Um, but I encourage you to look through the investor list. I guess one message I have, though, on mentorship, I think sometimes people confuse it with wanting to create this kind of hierarchical, structured, like here's my once a quarter meeting or a set of meetings I want to have with people. Um, mentorship or, or gaining advice can happen in many ways. It can happen through reading a quote. It can happen through watching a video. It can happen through absolutely face-to-face -face interactions. Um, you know, my mentors are my parents as well in terms of the example they've set to me and the uh, kind of uh, passion they had for creating a whole new life in this new place that enabled me to go do what I want to do. So I would just say it's not about collecting like famous names or collecting um, you know, people that uh, you can add to your resume. It really is about the uh, interaction you have with that individual. Yeah. So you talked uh, quite a bit about the value of infrastructure and how that's led a lot of your choices. But I was wondering, could you talk a little bit more about the conversation that you actually have with yourself during your discussion, how you go about defining some of these personal values in the first place, do that over a long course of time as well. Yeah, definitely. So the question was about introspection and kind of uh, how that journey has evolved for me. Um, and it's still evolving. I mean, for me, um, meditation is a key ingredient to that in terms of detaching from the frenetic nature of the day to day and just creating almost a more peaceful uh, moment in my day to go think about those types of questions. But I don't have a uh, rigid structure. It's not like I have four questions I ask myself and then you know, see how I map and give myself a grade. Um, it's mostly um, tied to kind of, I would say, two buckets. One is, um, have I spent the time the way I wanted to spend my time? And again, that might seem easy to say, but um, you actually have to collect data to get that sense, right? You can say, hey, this week I want to spend half my time on recruiting. And then, or I want to spend you know, 10% of my time exercising. 
And then it actually takes a little bit of homework to figure out, hey, I actually spent 2% of my time exercising and 70% of my time recruiting. What's wrong? Right? How do I calibrate? Maybe I should stop doing this, start doing that, delegate this, give this to someone else. Um, so that's one key part of it is kind of the time allocation and seeing if I'm doing what I want to do. Um, otherwise, you just become reactive to the environment you're in. Um, the second one is, is more just, call it like puncification, but it's just me thinking and dreaming a bit about like what the future looks like and you know, different things that could exist either in my personal life, professional life, um, but kind of trying to push the envelope. Um, and that, you know, again, is you could call that creativity. I think Tina obviously is very passionate on this topic. Um, that's an interesting part of business building. So much of a business is analytical and framework driven and data centric, and we have metrics on growth and revenue rates and hiring ramps. Um, but then so much of business building is this emotional quality of like people, and people are not objects or metrics. People are um, you know, unique in their own way, and there's, that's the whole point of, of hiring great people. Um, let's go right here. Um, yeah, I'm interested in uh, the development of your wish to create a own business. Was it something that you had from a very young age, or did it develop during your time at Stanford? Yeah, so the question was about my desire to create a business. Um, I guess the way I would phrase it, um, I've never had a desire to create a business. You know, what I realized, and definitely it was at Stanford, because um, before that I was just more curious, right? I, I was bothered by inefficiency. I was curious to learn new things. Um, I felt really good to help other people. And I was in Boy Scouts, I'm an Eagle Scout. We did a lot of work that was service-centric, um, visiting my mother's homeland, which is Bolivia, a lot of opportunity to go contribute back. Um, that always felt good, but those are just building blocks, right? Um, Stanford gave me more of a framework on this thing called high-tech, you know, venture formation, right? And the idea of how to use technology with business in a capitalist society to go solve meaningful problems. But even after that, you know, my motivation is not to build a business, it's to go solve a problem, right? And that's kind of how we think about hiring as well, um, is that we exist as a company to go solve a problem. And by the way, the way we're doing that is we're creating a company as a name, it's for profit, it's registered in Delaware. You know, we have profit targets, revenue targets. I mean, that's still all there, but the driver is solving a problem. This is all just a byproduct. Um, and so, you know, if you remember my story, the first startup I started, um, we didn't have a lot of that introspection in place. It just was reactive to just this part of it. And as a result, we didn't really know where we were going over time. Right? It just was working financially, um, but then something was missing. Um, it was after that, where I had that time for introspection, that it really crystallized to me on what would make me happy, which is always starting with the problem. So that took, you know, I guess I was, you know, 28, 29, when that realization happened. Hopefully, my advice to you lets that happen earlier on in your life. Yeah. I'm curious your views on competition and have the legacy uh, payroll operators adapted uh, change at all? Yeah. I think on a business related question like that, I'll just um, chat with you after. I want to try to focus on giving some advice to students, but happy to answer that afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you studied at Stanford, and you also said there are some good relations. The investors invest in your company because they want to support your cause. Yeah. Do you think it will be um, the same <coughs> success you had if you didn't study here, if you want to locate it here outside of this area? Um, in, in terms of the yeah. investment and connections? Yeah, so the question was related to kind of uh, how Stanford impacted the path we've been on and how much it's helped that. So to be clear, going to Stanford is absolutely a plus. If it was a negative, I would tell you all that, but no, it's, <laughs> it's a massive plus. Um, but I would put it in the same bucket of, look, it's not a prerequisite to building a business. I mean, there's many entrepreneurs, many of my teammates that joined that went to various universities, didn't go to university. So I would put it into the bucket of, look, there's a lot of ways that people or programs or um, skill set can help, but one of the beautiful aspects of a startup is that all of that goes away. When you're just three people sitting in a house trying to go build something and decide where you should be spending your time, um, all that matters is the way you spend your time. And so whatever you don't know, I mean, I think Stanford gives you some frameworks. It again gives you this incredible community of people that can help you, which you should all stay in touch with each other because um, wonderful people go on and do wonderful things. Um, but I really think uh, no matter what your background is, that's what makes Silicon Valley special, is that if you don't know something, you can go learn it. I mean, I can talk now a lot about leadership and product and sales and marketing. Um, I didn't take a lot of courses in those subjects. I went and did it. And then I'm the type of person that when I was doing something, I wanted to do it well. And so you can kind of think about it from that framework. If you want to learn how to do something, um, and you're someone that you believe really wants to do it well, just make yourself do it. 
And there's a pretty good bet you're not going to do it poorly. Um, you're going to try to do whatever you can to do it well. And in that process, you're going to learn a ton about how to do that thing, uh, if that helps. Yeah? Um, you said that what we do is not important, but who you do it is. And what do you think about it? And how was that uh, <laughs> Yeah, so the question was around kind of team. And uh, it's not just the what we do, it's who we do it with. So I obviously really, really agree with that message. Um, you know, the way I describe it in our business is it's not just about accomplishing a goal. Um, it's about being proud of how we accomplish that goal. And the way you accomplish a goal is based on people, right? It's day-to-day -day interactions, the team, the people that we contribute to that add to our community. Um, and so I think, again, there's many ways to build a business. But if you do adhere to this philosophy uh, and wanting to be proud of the journey versus just celebrate the destination, then um, you can never go wrong by overly focusing on people. Um, again, it's, it's the biggest enabler of success or failure. Yes? Um, sorry, part of that team was so many people coming from W. Did you ever have some issues with um Similar skill sets when you're starting? Yeah, so the question was around uh, kind of my comment on so many double E folks in the company. Um, and was there a downside to that? So I think, I mean, the broader question is really um, how similar or different should we be? And I think it's really important to clarify value system is, is a uh, philosophy, right? And again, we don't have the perfect value system. We just have one that we believe is right for us. Um, skill sets, personality biases, the variety of ways that make us all very different and unique. Um, really important to have as much diversity there as possible. So um, I think from a double E standpoint, we all had a bias towards a very analytical way of thinking. Now, in the context of our product and our business, that actually is a prerequisite, because our big insight early on was the ability to go automate this and then make it totally um, more humane, I guess, is the way to put it. Um, but uh, to be clear, we only have about five or six people now out of 75 that are double E. So it's more of a coincidence in terms of our early hiring. Yeah, go ahead. Any recommendations from going to being three people in a house to create awareness about your product? Um, how do you go from one state to 40 states? Yeah. How do people become aware that your system is just awesome? Yeah, so I think the question was around kind of marketing and awareness building. In particular, when you're just three people in a house, how do you get usage? So I think, again, it depends on your product. If you're a consumer product, it could be as simple as listing in the App Store. If you're a B2B product, um, it's a very different go-to-market. Um, I guess my message on the B2B side is um, get out of the house. I mean, literally, like if you want to have 10 customers, go find those 10 customers. And even before you build your product, go talk to them and say, hey, I'm thinking of building this. Here's what it will look like, even be a scribble or a list of bullet points and say, hey, if, if this exists, would you want it, right? And if you get a lot of people that said, yes, yes, that would be magical, right? That would be amazing, I would love that. And then you go build it and say, hey, here, I built what you just were wanting, it's here, try it. Then you have users, you have customers, right? So that would be the starting point, is um, don't think that it's just through a blog post or a website or, or ads. We didn't do any advertising um, for the first year and a half of the company. It was purely organic, driven by very high NPS, um, great customer satisfaction. Again, building a product that actually works. A lot of companies rush too fast to paid acquisition, spending money on Google and such. Um, nothing wrong with that, but if you do that too early on, you don't know if you've actually solved the problem. You're just driving a lot of users through in an unnatural, uh, uh, not cost-effective way. One more question? Yeah. So you're clearly incredibly thoughtful about everything. What are the things that are keeping you awake at night now? Hmm. Well, right now I'm in the middle of planning my, my wedding. So <laughs> that's uh, one thing that's been on my mind quite a bit. Um, but beyond that, um, I think one way to also answer that question, I get asked, you know, what keeps you up at night? Um, I sleep great. And, I, and that doesn't mean that we don't have a lot to do. There's not a lot of problems to solve. There's not a lot of work to get done. But I think that's actually a really important note to make. Um, there's a certain culture in Silicon Valley that celebrates heroics. And uh, you know, the, you stayed up all night, great job. And trust me, I've done that in the past quite a bit. Um, but I have a saying in the company that I think really drives this message home. Um, you know, heroism doesn't scale. Heroes become martyrs. And if you want to build an enduring business that scales many, many years or decades into the future, you have to build a way to grow that ties to um, distributing responsibilities, empowering others to be owners. So when I think about what keeps me up at night, although I sleep well, it's, um, it's what are the main puzzles in our business. And in our case, it's focus. It's are we spending our time on the right things, right? Are we investing our resources in the right projects? Um, and then kind of compared to that as well, it's 
even though we're growing very quickly, you know, we're going to be adding you know, 150 people to the company this year, going from 75 to over you know, 200 people. Um, are we maintaining the culture that makes us special? Are we maintaining the quality of service that has built our success thus far? And that ties to a lot of internal things. Most of my time right now when I talk to investors or talk to the team is spent thinking about organization, thinking about the way we communicate, the way we hire, um, the way we celebrate people's first days in the company and all the traditions associated with that. Great. Join me in thanking Josh for this amazing talk.